I mean, the gap in terms of the two points. That's like a 540. Up to New York, and they were missing it. That's right. I'm sorry. 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 How do you do? That's me. <laughs> oh, right. I see. Yeah. 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 It's on. Put it? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. Oh, I right. see. Right. So, what are you writing on? Oh, right. It's interesting. Yes. 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 It's very interesting. You know that I've done on the West China rearmament. Um, but, of course, the, there was always concern about the neutral Germany. Yeah. Because yeah. I think it's the anti communist and uh, Germany. Interest yeah. and goal for unification is somewhat different than really the same level. Yeah. Of course, of course, yeah. United States did not think that was the case. Yeah, there was a lot of propaganda because of it. Mm. Mm. It could be uh, 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 yeah. Right, right. Because they are also final spies in the German government. So they have to make propaganda that. So you're looking at some kind of um, transnational actors, you know, sort of, sort of organization trying to disseminate sort of kind of information yeah. about. Um, Interesting things I yeah. discovered uh, recently was, of course, the Soviet Union unjammed yeah. it into the global mass and during this Geneva the Tons period. Yeah. And they uh, imposed again this jamming yeah. after the Hungarian yeah. uprising. So there was a sort of opportunity for the yeah, you know, sure end of the Cold War. Yeah. 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 So are you still chairing the. Yeah. 
Speak to you later. I heard the crowds are a lot noisier. What's that? The crowds are heard are a lot noisier. <laughs> More like a baseball game kind of thing. <laughs> Scholars are like all really, you know, respectful. Well, give, give us a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I think we'll get started. I'm sure there will be a few stragglers, but since um, uh, this session is being broadcast um, both via the web as well as as well as via VOA. Um, I'd like to get started halfway on time. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Christian Osterman. I direct the Center's History and Public Policy Program, which also includes, of course, the um, at least thus far much better known Cold War International History Project. Uh, one of the Wilson Center's core missions is to facilitate dialogue between the public policy community here in Washington as well as the broader scholarly community. One of the ways in which we try to do this is by providing historical context to important public policy issues. Today's session uh, sent us around three new publications that try to do just that and we're pleased to have the authors, all distinguished scholars with us today to talk about these books and then to engage with one another and with all of us into fruitful discussion. Let me introduce them in turn. Each of our speakers then will talk for about 15, 20 minutes so that we should have, I hope, plenty of time for discussion um, <coughs> involving all of you. Our first speaker is Saki Dakru. Saki, to my immediate left here, is Professor of Contemporary History and International Security at the Department of War Studies, King's College in London, mm -hmm. and author of The End of the Cold War Era, just published. Let's just hold up this book. This is just out and available outside. Dr. Dockrow um, was an Olin Fellow at the Department of History at Yale University. She joined the Department um, of War Studies in 1990, first as a MacArthur Research Scholar, then as a full-time lecturer, uh, was later appointed in 93 lecturer, and 97 senior lecturer. She's also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and uh, was a teaching fellow at the Institute of United States Studies at the University of London. She is the general editor of the Macmillan Palgrave Cold War History book series um, and has um, and is one of the uh, most prolific British historians on the Cold War, I should add. With that, let me turn it over to Saki. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Um, 
Well, the title of this talk is really about the Cold War and contemporary conflict. Um, I have heard uh, so many times, particularly uh, through the American debates about new Cold War. Um, is there any such things like new Cold War? Because you can actually draw uh, many lessons uh, from the end of the Cold War, which might be applied to uh, the understanding of the present war on terrorism. Although I disagree with this concept of new Cold War entirely, and that's where perhaps we can kick off our conversation today. My book is about the original synthesis and examines the continuities and discontinuities uh, between the end of the Cold War and the new security climate after the 9-11. And of course, history does not uh, repeat itself but provide us, I suppose, a nuanced understanding of the present world and possibly the future. Perhaps a good starting point is about really what is really the Cold War is really about. Cold War is about the struggle against communist ideas and about the regime change in and democratization of the Soviet Union. The Cold War was fought very much on the assumption that if you are not with us, you are against us. An assumption that figured more prominently in American society than the Western European counterparts. There are many, uh, numerous at least, popular images about the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. For instance, we tend to think that Gorbachev is really initiated the end of the Cold War, and, and also Gorbachev eventually gave in uh, uh, Western, Eastern Europe, and then all other things which the Soviet Union previously upheld, and, uh, such as ideological confrontation and somewhat ideological expansionism in the third world, it all gave way to the understanding of the two worlds, that is to say, capitalist world and socialist world. And Gorbachev even said, we would like to kind of set up, setting up kind of a condominium between the East and the West. And two are together, he often say, to uh, Reagan, Ronald Reagan, US president at that time, we could actually uh, handle the international affairs uh, much more efficiently uh, rather than through confrontation. So this essentially sort of main theme about um, cooperation rather than confrontation and seems to be core of uh, Gorbachev's ideological uh, peace offensive, if you like, uh, towards the end of the Cold War. However, as, you, as we know, Gorbachev uh, calculated that Soviet Union could better maintain its power and influence uh, through the peaceful cooperation rather than confrontation. And what happened after 1989, after the Berlin Wall was breached, was not about what Gorbachev had planned. And in fact, it had happened uh, almost by miscalculation and by accident. So therefore, the Gorbachev did not really end the Cold War. In fact, the terms of the end was exclusively uh, on the Western terms, which we did not particularly appreciate at that time. And by saying that, one could say that West won the Cold War, which is not quite true either. America not necessarily simply won the Cold War. There was a combination of a soft power and hard power, which eventually compelled some pro-Western thinkers in the Soviet Union to think that, in fact, cooperation may be the better way of uh, consolidating Soviet power and influence. And thinking about how the Cold War ended, we mustn't forget that this uh, concept of detente, uh, which uh, particularly uh, built upon from European understanding of the uh, Cold War. From European point of view, detente could be said to be alternative to the end of the Cold War because Europeans tend to think that perhaps we could eventually have normal relationship 
with the Soviet Union, without ideological confrontation, without ideological expansionism. So um, through the detente, if you remember, we had uh, lots of cultural and trade and economic exchanges with the with, uh, Eastern world. But detente does not really mean to be a conversion of ideas. There was no way in anywhere I have read in Western uh, documents and understanding of the Cold War at that time, uh, Europeans and Americans were united in the view that Western ideas and various beliefs would eventually prevail. So it's not nothing like Europeans wanted to compromise with the uh, Soviet ideas, but they truly believed that their ideas eventually would prevail, which I think it did. However, I think we must first appreciate how limited was the end of the Cold War. Uh, as far as we can see, what actually Cold War ended was uh, quite limited. And I, I'd like to talk about this under the three headings. Uh, first, in Europe, Cold War ended, and do you think that Europe therefore became whole and free and united? On the contrary. Europe, after the end of the Cold War, particularly after 1989, through to really up to mid-1990, was still very much divided. And in fact, division Europe probably looked at one time starker in terms of the uh, difference, uh, uh, in terms of level of stability, in terms of the industrialization, in, the, in terms of hum, uh, human rights. There was a so the big difference between western part of Europe and eastern part of Europe. We became gradually coming into the sort of European entity uh, just, night, uh, just right now, still in the process of uh, European integration on the basis of uh, western systems and institutions, but also taking account of the uh, conditions and problems which existed in the eastern part of Europe. So after the end of the Cold War, Europe was not as united as Americans might have believed. Second part, what about nuclear weapons? It's true a uh, superpower eventually agreed uh, on deep cuts on the super, uh, nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons at that time, about 50,000 nuclear weapons was in the hands of both superpowers. So, in a sense, we lived in the fear of a possible uh, nuclear uh, stand, global stand, which could have actually destroyed the world, stand instantaneously. However, we did not, in a sense, superpower confrontation, end of superpower confront confrontation, did not really resolve the problem about the uh, fear of surprise attack. Consider the Reagan's, or, uh, consider the Reagan's uh, strategic defense initiative, or Star Wars. Why he ever actually thought of this idea? Because the idea was not just merely against the Soviet Union, but it's he also <coughs> considered, you know that those missile technology was so easy, so you never known as kind of lunatic or anyone else can actually target the United States. So in that sense, one could say that he was very much um, far-sighted in thinking that we must have some kind of mechanism against a surprise attack. And of course, end of the Cold War did not really end that problem. In the third item is the third world. There was, of course, towards the end of the Cold War, particularly 1970s, 80s, there was a lot of those third world conflicts and particularly in Angola in Africa, and Nicaragua in Central America, and of course Central Asia, Afghanistan. Again, end of the Cold War did not really resolve the problems, in the local problems, and the causes of problems in the third world countries. Um, but as all these problems became, someone said, area studies, so people don't really look at Nicaragua in the context of superpower confrontation but it's a part of Central American studies. So again here, we, uh, by polar system, completely overlooked and neglected the problems arising from the decolonizations. 
There was also a lot of misleading assumptions, which obviously do not really, um, uh, do not really help us to understand the present world better. Uh, part of the problem was, of course, domination of the world by superpowers did not really explain the globalization. In fact, globalization was taking place in parallel with the Cold War. In fact, globalization itself was affected to some extent the Cold War structure and also vice versa. Think about development, info, uh, development of information technology, science, and also the uh, world economic order was, seems to be taking place outside the tight bipolar system, particularly in uh, 70s and 80s onwards. And also, so much emphasis on globalization, we are missing out completely the effect of fragmentation of the societies in the world on the uh, international community. Fragmentation is really other side of the same coin, that is to say opposite uh, to globalization, in that minority interests are protected vis-a-vis uh, -vis the majority by means of unilateralism, separatism, nationalism, including, of course, rise of uh, political Islam. So those, given the fragmentation, globaliza uh, globalization, let us to uh, think about the uh, concept of sovereignty differently, which became more clearly uh, after the end of the Cold War. But if you remember Kofi Annan, the current uh, UN Secretary General, once said around in the mid 19, uh, around in the mid 1990s, he said, "UN Charter is protect the sovereignty of people. It was never meant as a license for the government to trample on the human rights and human dignities." He concluded, "Sovereignty means responsibility and not just power." And given those uh, different factors, which is coincided with the progress of the Cold War. The, we tend to think triumph, uh, uh, triumph of capitalism, but we don't seem to understand how fragmentation of society affected after the end of the Cold War. So witness of the humanitarian interventions and somewhat political interventions took place in the 1990s, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Somalia, Rwanda, etc. And the US public at that time also had shifted to the right so did Congress, because the United States believed you now come out of this world, which is only United States, only United States can control, only United States can dominate the world, and there was no rivals. Unlike Cold War period, United States felt that we have no constraint. We don't have to look over the shoulders to look at how other allies were thinking. So it's all this, uh, the factors which I think basically our misunderstanding of the Cold War and neglecting the factors uh, taking place outside the Cold War, we actually uh, situated ourselves in a world which totally misunderstood and actually uh, misunderstood and actually uh, neglected the kind of the international community, what is the mental mood is. And one thing before I finishing I want to say about what is really Cold War is about is a really resentment against the control. And all the people do not really want to be controlled by either ideology or systems or Kremlin or from Washington. This is really about what Cold War is about, how Cold War ended. And those are lessons perhaps we can something to learn from the end of the Cold War. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saki. Let me just, uh, um, you want to, to say it's the, the book was published by Hodder and Arno. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and again, is, is available outside. Yes. It's actually been available from the uh, Oxford University uh, in the United States, so that, Oxford that, University Press. That makes it even easier. Thank you. Our next panelist uh, is also to be congratulated for a new publication, uh, winning the Long War, Lessons from the Cold War for Defeating Terrorism and Preserving Freedom. James Carofano is Senior Fellow for National Security and Homeland Security at the Heritage Foundation.
Um, you don't have your uh, book to hold up, uh, Jim, but feel free to uh, uh, give further details of um, how the book um, can be obtained. Um, Dr. Carafano is one of the Heritage Foundation's leading scholars in defense transformation, military operations and strategy, as well as homeland security. He was an assistant professor at the U.S. Military Academy in West Point, served as director of military study studies at the Army's Center of Military History. He's also taught at St. Mary's College and served as fleet professor at the U.S. Naval War College. He was also a visiting professor at the National Defense University and Georgetown University. And it's a great pleasure to have him here. Jim, Thank you. Well, first yours. of all, I'm uh, deeply honored to be sitting here with my esteemed colleagues, Saki and Tom. It's always an honor. Uh, I feel very comfortable sitting over here on the far left of the table as well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, I, I actually, I think, want to talk more about the, the um, uh, focus on the origins of the Cold War as um, than, than the end. So I think we'll make, actually make a very, very nice book. And, and I, too, want to kind of focus on lessons. I think actually one of the most remarkable things, and probably the most disappointing from a historian's point of view, is that you know, when, we, when we quickly transition from Cold War to the long war against terrorism, the, the, uh, the, the first thing you had to do is if you want to disparage or, or discourage or, or uh, um, reject something, you'd call it a legacy of the Cold War. And so uh, people seemed, at least the policymakers, seemed intent on neglecting and ignoring and avoiding, you know, 40 years of international history and, and lessons learned as if something, you know, the whole world had been created out of whole cloth on September 11th, 2001, and we didn't need to think about the past anymore. Uh, maybe it was just to put all us historians out of business, I don't know. Um, you know actually, I was at, uh, out at um, Cantini last week, they had a terrific conference. I wish Saki could have been there on, on the end of the Cold War. And uh, we were lamenting is some of the remarkable myths, not necessarily among you know historians, but in, in kind of the general public, which have kind of emerged, like somehow the Cold War was this mythical, wonderful past where there was no strategic ambiguity, and we knew exactly who our enemies and friends were, and you know our allies always cooperated with us, and our our enemies were always clear. I mean, this is, of course is silliness. I mean, it was, it was the world was equally complicated and complex and convoluted then as it is now, and this notion of somehow looking back for, to the good old days of, comp of competition was just ridiculous and disheartening. And so part of the reason why we wrote the book is we argued that, you know, maybe, maybe there is something to learn from the Cold War, and we shouldn't just reject our past out of hand and assume that the present is different. So we really went back and focused the Cold War. And, and the question we asked was very simple. Is we, we began with a basic premise, and perhaps we can debate this, that the one thing that the, the Cold War and a war against terrorism have in common is that they're protracted competitions, they're protracted conflicts. Then because of nuclear standoff between East and West, I think in this because transnational terrorism, whatever you want to think about or whatever you want to call it a war or whatever, is, is a group uh, of disparate people that are scattered all over the planet and, and even if you knew clearly who they were, it would take time to root them all out. And I don't think anybody argues that, that the, the conflict against transnational terrorism is going to end anytime soon. So, so if it's a protracted conflict, that's a war of a different character, and, and how do you do that? And it seems to me that the, the question we should have asked ourselves on September 20, 2001 was, how do you win a long war? And, and it's not like there's no, no data to draw on. There's lots of long wars in history. I mean, the history is full of protracted conflicts, and, and most of them are fairly typical. What happens in a protracted conflict is as states get more desperate to win, and it, it, they, they tend to become more authoritative. They tend to pull power towards the center, they tend to uh, increase taxation, uh, and the the irony of the of that is, as states do that, they actually tend to be, become less competitive. They become less flexible. They become less productive. And so, most long wars, whether you're talking about the war, Peloponnesian War against Athens and Sparta, or uh, which I, from my good days working for Tom, I now know well because the the taproot of the Naval War College course, or or the, or the World War One, is what happens is most long wars turn into conflicts of attrition. At the end, both sides are exhausted, and, and the question is who won is really who cares. And there are actually very few long wars in history where one side comes out dramatically better than the other. And and the Cold War, I think, is, is one of those unique and remarkable events where the United States at the end of the Cold War uh, is a stronger, more powerful, more vibrant, um, more free nation than it was when the war started. And, and the Soviet Union, the enemy, is gone. Uh, and so I think the question we should ask is how do we do that? And, and we really did focus on the origins of the Cold War because I really think in many ways that that period is very, very analogous to the period we're now. And where it is an, a period of strategic ambiguity and, and, and wrestling and trying to figure out the, what's changed in a, in a new international scene and how it's different from the era before that. 
And so there's th three kind of quick lessons that framed our thing. First is that it takes time. And, then, and this is specifically from a U.S. perspective. Um, it takes time to learn how to fight a long war. I mean, the National Security Act of 1947 creates what becomes for America the great weapons that it used to fight the Cold War. You get the National Security Council, you get the, uh, what becomes the CIA, you get what becomes the Department of Defense. But I think if you really look, there's a period of about 10 years of, of trial and error and figuring things out and scratching your head that, that are very, very dramatic and very flexible, about 47 to 57. And I would really argue by 1957, everything that we used to fight the Cold War had really been invented, with per perhaps the exception of Star Wars. And that every president after that pretty much uses the, the same instruments. And it, it really took many years for the United States to figure out how to mobilize the instruments of national power and how it was going to be used in this long conflict. I don't think that's necessarily unreasonable in, in, a, in a very different strategic kind of situation. Um, and the, the, the second lesson is kind of the, the confluence. And I, I think the one lesson I would draw from that, this notion that we don't have all the answers on what to do in the first 10 minutes, uh, I, I think is pretty unremarkable. That the notion that it will take several years for, for people to figure out how to adjust to this, this uh, era is, is not unremarkable at all. The, the flip side to that is um, this is probably the critical moment that I mean, I've discovered now, you know, being in the, in the think tank world as opposed to the academic world that I've, and living in Washington, I've discovered that Washington's greatest industry is inertia. Uh, once something in this town is created, it cannot be created nor destroyed. It can just be renamed. I, I mean, seriously, I mean, what happens is once, once organizations and processes are created in Washington, they immediately start to accumulate stakeholders. And, and once they, they accumulate stakeholders and, and, and proprietary interests, it becomes incredibly difficult to change that. And what happens if things don't get changed, they tend to stay that way a very, very long time. And, and the example that we talk about in the book is that you look at the Department of Defense. Created in 1947, it, it created a, a, by political fiat, deeply flawed instrument, lots of problems with it, um, a little bit of tinkering, but I mean, nothing really gets done. And so the, the, the limitations of the Department of Defense really perpetuate until the passage of the Goldwater-Nichols Act a mere 40 years later and, and, and all of three years before the end of the Cold War. And so I argue is, is that although it does take time to get the instruments right, you need to really focus at the beginning because the way the United States works is once the stakeholders are established, the budget shares are set, that, that really gets set in concrete and things will continue on that course until the next great tragedy or momentum changing event. Um, which kind of leads to the, to the third point is, is to do that, you know, to kind of work your way through the trial and error period and also to, to kind of re, you know, make the right changes early on and learn from your mistakes, you really have to have a strategy. I mean, I think the strategy is particularly essential to protracted conflict. And, and, I, and, it, it, and what we try to argue in the book is, is that we can learn good long war strategy from the Cold War. And I, th I think it starts with the notion that, that we have to reject this idea that what we actually did during the Cold War was containment. I think containment actually pretty poorly describes what the United States did during the Cold War. It didn't contain the Soviet Union in any way, shape, or form other than it, it contained them from annihilating us with nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, much as we can, they contained us from annihilating them. But, but really what the United States did during the course of the Cold War was outcompete the Soviet Union. And, and so what we do in the book is, is we really argue that there are four elements of good long war strategy. And, and I, uh, we credit this in the book really to Eisenhower, which I really continue to believe, much like Reagan was one of our underrated presidents in terms of their great contributions to the Cold Wars. Uh, you know, Eisenhower was, was uh, he was a strategist. And, uh, and I did think that, that Eisenhower brought a strategic framework to the U.S. approach to the Cold War. It didn't exist before. I, I, have, I have personal biases against Truman. He sent my dad to Korea and almost got him killed, and I've never quite forgiven him for that. But, but that aside, I do think if you look at the, the, the accumulation of things that are done in the Truman era, there, there are a lot of activities, but they don't really add up to a grand strategic concept. And I really do think Eisenhower brought this to, I don't think he never got credit for it. I don't think it was ever fully articulated, but it existed. And I'll just run through the four components of the long war strategy that I think are, are evident very quickly uh, and uh, ended at that. The first one is security. Uh, you have to have an offensive component. Uh, I, I don't think anybody fights any war without some ability to take the initiative for the enemy. Nobody wants to fight a war where the enemy has the initiative. So you have to have an offensive component to that. I think that's particularly going to be true in, in the war on terrorism. The more and more that, we, that I analyze this stuff, the more I, I think that the, the way to deal with terrorism is you have to stop it to begin with. You've got to get the leaders, break up the networks, dry up the sources of funding, cut off the suicide recruiting, separate uh, the terrorists from their, their potential base of support. Um, 
But you also have to have defense, and I think um, that's particularly true in, in uh, uh, particularly true in the war on terrorism. I mean, we live in a world today which is different uh, in some respects from the Cold War, and that almost the entire globe is united on networks that carry the free flow of goods, services, trades, uh, uh, people, and ideas. You know, we like it that way. It's what made the United States uh, more powerful than the Soviet Union. It's what continues make, to make us thrive, it, what makes our allies thrive, it, what lifts developing countries out of poverty. Uh, but that always means that it, and someday you're going to bring bad things to your doorstep. And so certainly you have to have a defensive component. And I don't think anybody today on the right or left would argue with that, that there has to be a mix of offensive and defensive components, not necessarily purely military, but, but encompassing all the elements of national power, law enforcement, intelligence, uh, diplomacy, and everything else, but that, that you have to have both an offensive and defensive component. So you have security. But, but that's not enough. And I really do think Eisenhower got that. I mean, you know, I mean, he did say it's guns and butter stupid. I mean, at, at the end of the day, what really a allows a country to uh, thrive in a protracted conflict is economic growth. Because that's what gives you the strength to, because this is a marathon and not a race. And, economic growth and potential allows a country to compete over the long term. And one of the things we talked about in the book, for example, is when Sputnik was launched. And, and the enormous debate that rose out of that, uh, which was concomitant, of course, with the, with the, study, with the study being done by the Gaither Report, right, and with the Gaither Commission, which, you know, like, like all good commissions, saw an opportunity uh, when, they, when, they, when it presented itself and, and uh, when, when the, the, everybody was spun up, I used to say everybody went ballistic over Sputnik, but that just seemed like such a bad pun, I stopped doing that. But that there was this enormous uh, um, uh, uncertainty with Sputnik, if they launched a, a satellite, they could launch a nuclear weapon. And so the Gaither Commission, of course, leaked the sensitive portions of their report where they cost, called for massive increases in offensive systems and also massive increases in civil defense spending. You know, and Eisenhower took one look and he said, this, we're not going to do this. He goes, this is unrealistic. He says, we're not going to bankrupt the U.S. economy. Uh, be, that, that, that's excessive. And, and he says, we're not going to, you can't create security in a protracted conflict at the expense of economic growth. Um, so and I, and I think that's, that's true in the war on terrorism, the, the notion that you would, this is a, an enemy that's weaker than you are, that can't compete with you over the long run anyway, and the thought that you should self-weaken yourself by, by taking away your one absolute true advantage, which is the ability to outcompete the enemy is just ridiculous. So there's a security component, there's an economic component, and there's also a component of civil liberties because at the end of the day it is, the, and I don't think it, this means popularity polls, I think at the end of the day there's the cohesion of the society that allows you to compete over the long terms. And a good portion of that is the protection of basic civil liberties and privacies. And much as Eisenhower kind of rejected McCarthyism and, and, and you know, there are other people in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that era that wanted to reject um, um, the civil rights movement and said, let's just put that off until the end of the Cold War. And, and Eisenhower said, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, we can't do that. The notion that you're, that you're going to strengthen your civil society by depriving a large portion of your citizens so you have their basic rights just makes no sense. So that, uh, and, it, and it's not a balancing that you're not trading things off. You're not trading off security for civil liberties or trading off security of economic growth. You're creating security mechanisms that provide all three. And then the fourth and final component of that is, is that, that, that there really is a war of ideas, that it is an ideological struggle in the end, and that you have to engage in the war of ideas. I mean, certainly Eisenhower creating the Voice of America and, and a lot of the covert programs recognize that. And, and so our argument basically in, in the book is, and divided in different chapters as we talk about these different components, security, economic growth, um, protection of civil liberties and privacies and the ideological struggle. We, and we look at some of the early lessons of the Cold War and, and some of the things that were done right and wrong in the Eisenhower and Truman years. Uh, and then we look at some of the, the opening, our opening gambits in the long war on terrorism and talk about where we think that we have tried to embrace elements of a good long war strategy and some of the places where we think those elements are missing. And I uh, hope to get to talk about those later. So uh, let me end it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Um, our final speaker is Professor Tom Thomas Nichols. Uh, Tom is Professor of Strategy and Policy at the U.S. Naval War College. He is author of a book very relevant to today's discussion, Winning the World, Lessons for America's Future from the Cold War, published in 2002. He is currently also a senior associate of the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs, I believe in New York. Um, he holds a PhD from Georgetown University and a certificate from the Harriman Institute um, at Columbia. He has taught at a variety of universities, 
international relations and government at Georgetown and Dartmouth. He has also taught as a secretary of the Navy fellow at the Naval War Co College. He has served as an aide in the United States Senate and was a fellow, fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. He is certainly a prolific uh, contributor to all sorts of forums on international relations and government, I think well known to many of you, and it's with great pleasure to have him here with us today. Tom. Thank you, Christian. And uh, let me just echo what <coughs> Jay said. It's very much an honor for me to be on a panel with Saki and Jay and, and uh, two people whose work I respect so much. Um, nice thing about batting cleanup is you get to make a few comments on the things you've heard before. Um, Jay, I, I think I'm, I feel a little warmer about Truman uh, than you do. My dad, in 1945, was at Fort Ord, California, waiting to ship for Operation Olympic. Okay. So, <laughs> well, you know, actually, my dad was actually my dad was in, was in at Fort Lewis waiting to go out too. So that you know, but you know, it's, it, that doesn't cut it. Of course, of course, a couple of years later, probably not so popular. So. <laughs> um, well, let me start. I, I always tell my students that I'm, I, I'm a child of American pop culture, and so uh, I tend to think in uh, popular references. So let me start with um, a myth of the Cold War that was perpetrated in many movies, but my favorite, and of course I'm sure you will all recognize this as a towering work of American cinema, the movie Red Dawn, um, starring noted thespians Patrick Swayze and Charlie Sheen. Uh, the Cold War myth that sort of spurred me to start writing what I wrote was a scene in the movie where uh, the kids, and if, if you're not familiar with the movie, um, it's a classic work of uh, um, American <laughs> optimism where a bunch of kids take hunting rifles into the mountains of Colorado during the Soviet invasion of the United States and single-handedly fend off the Spetsnaz because, you know, they live in Colorado. Uh, so they find a downed U.S. Air Force pilot uh, and they ask him. They have no idea what started this war. They have no idea why all these Soviet paratroopers have shown up on their doorstep. And so they ask this, this American colonel, you know, what's going on? And he says, well, um, you know, the Europeans are sitting this one out, except, of course, for the British. Uh, and then he adds, and they won't last long. Uh, one of the kids says, who is on our side? And he says, uh, 600 million screaming Chinamen to which the kid says, I thought there were a billion, and the colonel says there were. <laughs> and then finally, they get to the nub of the issue. He says, well, what started this? And, and, the, and the, the script says, well, two biggest kids on the block. Sooner or later, they're going to fight, I guess. And that, as much as I enjoy this piece of escapist nonsense, it, it's, it just stuck in my throat, that, that comment. Well, why did this happen? Well, because they were the two biggest kids on the block. It just was going to happen because big, and it was almost a kind of cinematic statement of realism. That it was a sort of succinct, realist explanation of the Cold War. Two big guys, got a lot of weapons, bumping into each other in parts of the world. Ergo, you have a Cold War. And I said, you know, this just, this just isn't making sense to me. I mean, we, we, you know, we don't go to sleep at night worrying about British nuclear weapons. We don't go to sleep worrying about French well, we don't go to sleep worrying about other countries' nuclear <laughs> weapons. And, and it, it, it seems to me that anybody who lived through the Cold War kind of would intuitively reject that kind of argument. So it, it led me to ask some questions about, as we gained more information after the fall of the Berlin Wall, how many of our sort of intuitive or counterintuitive beliefs were correct? Um, I came to the conclusion that what this really was about, and I suppose I agree here more with Jay than, than with Saki about this, um, that what the Cold War really was about was not control of resources or control of populations or, or people rebelling against certain kinds of um, beliefs, and I hope I'm not mischaracterizing what Saki said, but it really was about uh, competing ideological viewpoints. It really was about two fundamentally different beliefs about how the world should be ordered. And that's why, that's why I called the book Winning the World, because this, this was really about all the marbles, that you had two competing socioeconomic, I mean, I mean, I suppose I sound like a Soviet spokesman here, we have two competing socioeconomic models, and only one was going to come out of this uh, dominant. And I would even go so far as to say that with the end of the Cold War, uh, of course, you know, um, Francis Fukuyama isn't here to defend himself, so... Uh, so, but, I, but I am going to actually give him a, a bit of support here and say, 
it may not be the end of history or ideology as far as the world is concerned, but I think it really is the end of history, at least in ideological terms, where the West is concerned, where the developed world is concerned. That, are, that if, with all of the caterwauling about how things are backsliding in Russia and, um, and so, sort of the other, I, what I think are relatively minor concerns, the big argument, the big, the big debate between uh, libertarian individualism and totalitarian uh, communalism is over. <coughs> it's done. And, and, and I think that's the thing that had these two superpower blocks at each other's throats. And I think um, you see that in, in the evidence. I mean, before that was an assertion, for years, <coughs> Soviet, you know, we were, Sovietologists were like economists, put three of us in a room, you get five opinions. But I, I think that the evidence was very clear, and I, I'm going to steal a line from Wojtek Masny, that there was no double bookkeeping in the Soviet bloc. They didn't come out and stand on, on top of Lenin's tomb and talk about you know, imperialist encroachment and the glories of socialism and then shut the doors and say, Whew, man, am I glad that's over. Pop open a scotch and put on the Sinatra records. They didn't do it. They talked exactly the same way behind closed doors that they did in public. And to me, that says that they were deadly serious about what they were doing. And um, that leads to the question, if, if that's what the Cold War was about, um, then that leads to the question of, well, how, how did it end? And why did it, did it end the way that it did? And I think this has relevance for the kind of long struggle, and I think Jay's laid out very well the, the, the kind of tenets of a long struggle um, against an ideological opponent. Um, how, how did it end? I think it ended because those central ideological tenets were defeated. Now, in some cases, they were defeated by the experience of people, you know, I, I think one epitaph to the Cold War, at least, where people behind the Berlin Wall were concerned is uh, Groucho. It's, it's a famous Marxist line, but Groucho, not Karl, um, which is, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Uh, as more and more people became, I, I really think that a big part of the end of the Cold War, and I think this is distinctly relevant to the war against Islamic totalitarianism, is that uh, people could not tolerate the level of cognitive dissonance that was, was increasingly being forced on them. There's a line that I use somewhere in the book um, that came from a, a wonderful study Paul Hollander did where he talks about a, a Soviet cab driver who manages to finagle a, a, a trip to the West. He goes to West Germany. And of course, this is a guy who's been standing in line for bread. And he goes, of course, to West Germany. And you know, there's shops all over the place. And he said, uh, his quote was, I began to think that only fools live in Russia. Because, of course, he'd been told all along. Um, I, well, actually, I can let me just relate a personal um, anecdote about this. I, uh, in, in 1991, just as the Soviet Union was coming apart, uh, I was at the Naval War College, and I was tasked uh, to be part of a, it's a good military term there, huh, Jay, tasked. Uh, I was tasked to be part of an escort group for a group of visiting Soviet naval officers, very senior guys. One of them was a Victor III commander and attack sub commander. Um, these were all very serious men and very educated, very smart, very tough. We're walking down Fifth Avenue in New York City at like 10, 10.30 at night. And of course, there's you know, throngs of people out. And you know, this was, this was uh, relatively good weather. People running around all over the place. And, and my friend here is goggle-eyed. And I said, what's the matter? He literally stood there. He was dumbstruck. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, we were told that nobody was out on the street in New York City after about 8 o'clock. I said, well, either these people are all actors or someone lied to you. And you could see the process happening. You could see the, the kind of collapse of the mental house of cards of saying, this, this, these people do not look unhappy. This is New York City, and it is not you know, an angry race riot in the streets. These are all these sort of prosperous looking people. They're all eating pretzels and buying hot dogs and having a good time. And you know, something's not right here. So I think a big part of the end of, uh, and, and Saki actually had mentioned soft versus hard power, um, a big part of the end of the Cold War, I don't want to call it soft power, I'm not, I'm, I've never been comfortable with that term, but I, I want to say the power of example uh, that uh, I do think, I give great credit to the Reagan administration and ironically I will even say, as much as I have to struggle to say this, a certain amount of credit to Jimmy Carter um, before that. Uh, 
for the use of hard power, for basically eliminating war or coercion as an option for Soviet survival. Um, I, I can't remember who I'm stealing this line from. I'm a political scientist, so I, I freely adapt other people's work as my own. Uh, but as I think someone once made the comment that Gorbachev became a visionary sort of the way the Germans became visionaries in 1945, in, in late 1945, that you know, once it was all over, oh, we see the light now. Um, and I think that there is something to that. And I, and I agree fully that Gorbachev set in motion. To this day, Gorbachev does not have the number of the truck that hit him. I mean, he just does not, I think he set pr processes in motion that to this day he doesn't understand. I mean, you read his memoirs and they're just such, such utterly mendacious, self-congratulatory nonsense that, that I, I, you know, I had to keep putting it down and stop reading uh, um, throughout it all. But I think that part of the reason the Soviet system had to gravitate toward Gorbachev was that all other, because aside from the fact that people like Romanov were nuts, uh, but, but dangerous, I mean, you know, the, the, is that the Americans had really closed off force as an option. That, that by the, that the, that the kind of window for that had passed in the 70s and by the mid 80s, there really was no alternative. There was no way to look at the strategic situation and say that resorting to violence was going to produce a, any kind of outcome and there had to be some other way to try to go with the flow rather than to, than to buck against it. And of course, this ran against um, the opinion of some of our leading lights of Sovietology at the time, who I won't name. All right, Severin Bialer, anyway, uh, who said things like, well, the Soviets are just going to entrench harder, they're going to dig in harder, they're going to dig in their heels, they're going to really show us what for. And in fact, that wasn't the case. They didn't have the political resources, they didn't have the, the economic or material wherewithal to do that. And that was an important part of the equation. But the other part of the equation that was really crucial was to put the lie to what the Soviet system was trying to indoctrinate in its people. That every tourist who, and I, you know, I, back, in, back in the day, I suppose, I was not a big fan of these citizen to citizen exchanges because I thought that it was, um, you know, I, I witnessed a few of them in my time and they were sort of these let's hold hands, kumbaya, let's remember we all met at the Elba kind of nonsense that I thought really were being used by the Soviets. Nonetheless, what, they, what was positive about them and similar kinds of programs is that they would meet these Americans and they'd say, well, gee, they're really not bad people. They're not 10 feet tall. They don't want to kill our children. And, and gee, they're just so much better fed and healthier and taller and happier than we are. There's, there must, something right must be going on over there. And I think that that was an important part of, of bringing the system down, of putting the lie to the myth uh, about what the Americans were like. The Americans in particular, because I think with the Europeans, I, I, I think that's true. And then, Jay, I really take your point about, you know, this idea that back in the day, you know, we were all holding hands and, the, you know, the Europeans and the Americans were armed. To, I mean, that's utter nonsense. Um, it's, <laughs> France pulled out of NATO. I mean, let's remember that. Um, <clears throat> and, but I think that that was crucial to winning uh, the Cold War at that point. Now, let me, let me say a few words about... <clears throat> Rather than rehash sort of Cold War triumphalism, and I, I, I actually don't, I wear that label with a certain amount of pride. When people say, well, you're, you're a Cold War triumphalist, I say, well, yes, I am, actually. I'm very happy that we won and they lost, and I think that we did a lot of good things. And as Jay said, I think, you know, we came out of it stronger, freer, uh, better. It's, to me, the accusation of triumphalism is like saying, well, you're a, you're a Nazi triumphalist because the Allies beat Hitler. Well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take that label. Um, but what's the parallel with today? Well, I think, for one thing, um, one of the big debates, and I just went through this two nights ago at, up at the Carnegie Council where we had a kind of big debate about why, is Al, why does Al-Qaeda hate us? Why does a big segment of the Islamic, particularly the Islamic fundamentalist world, hate us? And the answer boils down to two things, and, and these really are a close parallel with the kinds of arguments that we had during the Cold War. One is they hate us because of stuff we do, the other option is they hate us because of what we are. I firmly fall into the they hate us because of what we are. I think that we could give them everything. We could pull out of the Middle East. We could take all our forces out of the region. We could abandon our support for Israel. And I think they would still be blowing up bombs uh, in, in Western capitals. Because much like the communists, to be in opposition to what we are as a people, as a culture, as a society, is fundamental to their belief about themselves. 
The Soviet Union fell when Gorbachev, again, I, and I think without really knowing what he was doing, I mean, we, we always impute this brilliance to this apparatchik from the Crimea, but when he said, well, maybe we shouldn't be having a big ideological struggle in the third world. Maybe we need to, maybe we need to refocus our relations as sort of normal interstate relations. Well, that was nothing less than saying, maybe I shouldn't be a communist anymore. Maybe I'm not a revolutionary. Um, I buy, I, I'm totally buying the Western Westphalian system of interstate <coughs> relations and leaving my revolutionary mission aside. Well, that's when, that's when it became, when it made no sense for the Soviet Union to be Soviet. At that point, you have abandoned your, fun your, 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 your very central uh, raison d'etre as a state. And I think in the same way that for a group like Al-Qaeda or for any Islamic fundamentalist totalitarian group, to be in opposition to Western culture is a matter of first principles. This idea that some, there's, there's um, a lot done now on sort of why are suicide bombers doing what they do and they do it because they want us out of their territory and they want real estate back and so on. If you look at Al-Qaeda's declaration of war against the United States from the late 1990s, getting out of the Middle East is fifth in their list of demands. It's preceded by things like convert to Islam, stop being you, stop being Western, stop being decadent, you know, stop not stoning your homosexuals in the public square, that kind of thing. And that, <clears throat> to me, puts you in a very different kind of struggle with a very different kind of enemy. This is, not a, this is not a normal kind of struggle with an opponent who wants something very specific that you can give him. This is an opponent, uh, Henry Kissinger is, t I'm not prone to quoting Henry Kissinger except for the funnier lines, but Kissinger once said something very dramatic to the effect of, this isn't about our policies, it's about our existence. And I think that that was, that is true now about the struggle with uh, international terrorism, and I think it was true then about the struggle with international communism. There is nothing that you can give an ideological opponent short of abandoning your own identity that is going to placate that kind of opponent. And I think that that's really the important point. And I think, to, and I'll finish with this, the parallel is that just as we defeated communism by exposing the lie, I think we have to defeat Islamic totalitarianism the same way. I, a ask yourselves, what is it that drives people like Osama completely bonkers about, about us? My, my theory, I don't believe that it has, it, Osama discovered, for example, he discovered the Palestinians very late in the game, after 9-11, after the invasion of Afghanistan. Oh, right, Af Palestinians, those two, and yeah, Iraq, etc. But if you really think about what has driven, driven this kind of um, belief system crazy, it's that Here's someone who wants to create a particular kind of world, right? He wants to create a particular kind of polity society, create a kind of caliphate, take, take the world back to the seventh century. Um, and what's part of the problem with that? Well, the problem is that people find this culture, that is to say Western culture, more appealing than what he wants to institute. And that was the same problem the communists had. There was a reason that all the landmines were on their side of the Berlin Wall. No one was trying to, you know, sneak into the Soviet Union. Uh, people were trying to get out because they found, now, there is the argument, of course, that, well, it's material, materialism and a better way of life and so on. But I also think that people generally, naturally want to be free. I mean, I guess I, believe, I agree with the president about this. And, uh, and I think that that kind of public diplomacy, that sort of put, constantly putting the lie to the idea that the West is this decadent, corrupt, awful place, um, be, by greater information and interaction, I think, is going to be crucial to defeating this kind of enemy, as it was in defeating the Soviets. Thank you, Tom. I think we have the makings here of an interesting discussion. And to start us off, I wanted to give Saki the mo a moment, an opportunity to respond, if you like, right now. Or, um, Thank you. And then we'll open it up to everybody. Fine. OK. Um, <coughs> I think just a couple of points before we uh, start discussing the issue. Um, the, I quite agree with this Eisenhower's um, heart and mind, uh, winning heart and mind campaigns. After all, I've written a book on the Eisenhower's New York strategy, and I really quite was impressed by the uh, multitude of ideas and methods of fighting Cold War, not just about uh, nuclear deterrence and containment. But I think we have to differentiate between the two. 
methodology, some of the methodology of fighting Cold War may not be uh, applicable to the problem which you're fighting right now, because not necessarily, this is not necessarily about American problems, but it's more about the problems about um, international community and Western alliances, uh, the, their attitude toward the United States. For instance, I could not imagine that the Western alliance or a transatlantic alliance could be as united as it has been during the Cold War. This is not going to be repeated uh, in the struggle of the uh, uh, terrorism, uh, global terrorism, for many reasons, which I'll probably refer to later. And the second point is, yes, I quite agree with that. I did say that uh, Cold War is about a struggle against these communist ideas to competing ideas. In that sense, I quite agree with that. But at the same time, I take note of uh, those new studies, recent studies coming from um, under the name of uh, New Cold War, and also lots of evidence coming from the, not only the uh, former Eastern Bloc countries, but it's also the many regional actors in Western Bloc. For instance, I'll give you two examples. For instance, South Vietnamese, of course, came out of very anti-communist, but not there necessarily pro-West. So we tend to assume that because of two competing, if you're against us, if you're with us, but not necessarily regional population, not necessarily respect it, or they don't necessarily think that Western style of democracy, particularly American democracy, was something they want to look up to as a model but we completely overlooked because we thought they were okay because they were anti-communist. So I think those issues were still relevant uh, for us to understand the source of problems today. The source of problems actually too. A was of course Al-Qaeda, it was always kind of extreme terrorist. They cannot understand our language, they cannot understand our values, and they're just coming out, everything opposing it. Uh, but it's also there was another problem. How are we going to deal with this unpopularity of Anglo-Saxon populations? Particularly, Britain was also very, not very popular currently on continental Europe. We have a kind of division of uh, European views on this, uh, the Iraqi war, and, uh, and also the way we are going to deal with uh, global terrorism in the individual countries, how far we can actually sacrifice our civil liberties and so on. Um, so there's the two problems. It's okay if you're talking about dealing with Al-Qaeda, of course they probably hate us, what we are. But we have to also deal with a growing unpopularity of the United States and Britain to a lesser extent in the Arab world, and also largely the international community. Remember that 70% of Europeans against, the war against, uh, against this uh, war, uh, war with Iraq whereas 80% of American population at that time supported it. And this is not just about Al-Qaeda vis-a-vis us. And that was a question I want to put into. Yeah. Can, can I just Sure. Yeah, I, well, I absolutely totally agree with Saki. The notion of calling this the new Cold War is an incredibly dreadful idea because I think if we could go back now as historians, calling it the old Cold War, we, we would say that wasn't such a great idea either. I mean, we, the term Cold War was so inappropriate for really describing the half century that we went through. I mean, first of all, it wasn't cold. I, on their, one time I used to be a speechwriter for the Army Chief of Staff, and it wasn't me. I swear to God, it was the other speechwriter that put the line in the speech that says, and we won the Cold War without firing a shot, whereupon we got 80 gazillion hate letters from you know, Vietnam vets and Korean War vets and you know, you know, occupation vets. You'd always say, well, what about all the, you know, the people that were killed? I mean, so certainly it, w it wasn't a Cold War in any sense, way, shape, or form. I mean, there was an enormous amount of violence in that period. And second of all, it wasn't all about a U.S.-Soviet confrontation. And, and, I, and I think I would agree with Saki that certainly I think one U.S. strategy went most wrong during the Cold War is when we tried to shoehorn regional conflicts and competition and put them into a uh, east-west um, context is when we kind of screwed up the most. Um, so I think any, any notion of kind of paint international relations and international conflicts in kind of a uh, Manichaean black-white framework is just a horrible idea. So I didn't think it was such a good idea then, and I would certainly agree that it's an awful, awful, dreadful idea now. I, I, would, I do take notion with the, the, I do think actually that the alliance structure in this conflict B will look an awful lot like the alliance structure in conflict A, and, and for two reasons. One, I think, is um, that the notion of, that the nation state is alive and well, 
uh, in the 21st century as it was, and that states will do what's in their interest. And uh, states were with us in the Cold War at the end, even though there were lots of times they didn't like us because they perceived it when it was in their interest to do so. And I, and I quite frankly think that a lot of states will do this. I think we tend um, to confuse popularity with core interests. And because pe things are unpopular and people are unpopular and wars are unpopular, it doesn't necessarily mean that states aren't going to cooperate in the end. And my, my, my most authoritative data for this is I, I teach a class at the National Defense University and all of my students are counterterrorism fellows from countries like Malaysia and Indonesia and Egypt and you know, Jordan, you know, guys that kind of have terrorists in there. And when we talk about U.S. foreign policy, they're incredibly helpful at pointing out to me all the mistakes and flaws and idiocies <laughs> that Americans do and how screwed up we are and, and you know, how we just don't get it and we go on and on. And they're very helpful to help me understand these things. But when we actually talk about transnational terrorism, none of these guys think you know, having an al-Qaeda branch office in their country is a great idea. I mean, there are quite honestly not many countries on the planet that are willing to sign up to have, to give transnational terrorists free reign in their country. So at the end of the day, nobody really, there aren't many people that really want these guys operating. And they're going to cooperate with us. They may not say it out loud. They may not take out billboard signs. But in terms of working against, there's going to be an awful lot of cooperation. And I think there is. And, uh, and the second thing is I do think that the ideological dimension does matter, that the uh, that that there is a and I and I don't like to call it and I would disagree with Tom on this point. I wouldn't I don't like to call it an Islamic ideology because I think that is actually exactly the wrong thing to do. I mean I think that what these terrorists are doing is incompatible with the Islamic religion. And I think any time we use cultural and, and religious terms to describe what they were doing, in a sense we're playing into their hands because they want to appear credible and legitimate. And therefore if you call somebody an Islamic terrorist, you kind of just pay them a compliment because after all, they're Islamic, can't be all bad. And if you use the word jihad, that's a, an honorable thing in the Quran, so that's not a bad thing. So I, I, I think that the use of religious words is actually inappropriate in trying to describe this ideology, which, I mean, other than calling it fascist, I'm not, not sure what else to do. But, but I think then again, you know, and we've had that debate before between fascism and whatever you want to call the other thing, democracy or freedom, whatever, and the freedom side uh, you know, tends, tends to win. The other interesting data point I'll put out is, I, I haven't looked at this in detail, but apparently a um, Canadian study came out last week which said the, world, the world's actually been safer in the last 20 years, that there have been less wars and, and less people who have died from political violence uh, over the last 20 years than there were during the Cold War. So again, maybe that I think reflects that there is in, 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 it's in a state interest not to have political violence and states that adopt the Western study, I, I think Michael Doyle in the end does have it right, they actually tend to be less competitive against each other. Ten seconds. Ten seconds, as one of my Russian colleagues used to say, <laughs> one, one for you and one for her. Um, one is, uh, in terms of whether the alliance could ever be that united again, I, I just remind everybody, and, and this is, I think, a, an unfortunate reflection on American foreign policy, but on September 12, 2001, NATO invoked Article 5 of the Charter, which had never been done during the Cold War. And I think there could have been greater unanimity, and I think we, we the Americans, dropped the ball on that. So, um, and Jay, just two things. First, in terms of regional conflicts, I agree with you about shoehorning them into an east-west conflict. The problem is that at the end of those conflicts, it was going to go one way or the other. The problem is that, the, that there was always this illusion that somehow the people, the actors in these conflicts some had a free choice that will just go a third way. And I guess I'm, gonna, I'm on the verge of sounding like John Foster Dulles, so I will stop there for a moment. And the phrase I used was not Islamic terrorism, but Islamic totalitarianism that this is a totalitarian strain. And I would, I would say the same thing about you know, Christians shooting up abortion clinics, that these are you know, sort of ex Christian extremist terrorists. It, 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 it makes no reflection on Christianity, but rather that it's a, it's a violent, oppressive offshoot of a particular religious ideology. So that's just a correction there. Thank you. Floor is open. I just want to remind everybody that we're talking about the Cold War and lessons of the past. I don't want this to um, uh, result in a just open-ended, freewheeling political discussion. So let's make sure uh, the historical context is the focus of the discussion mm -hmm. here. All the way in the back, sir. If you could please identify yourself. Yes, Yaroslav Anders, Voice of America. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you about one, I think, very fundamental di distinction between what is going on now and what was going on during the, the Cold War, uh, namely, uh, the, we were dealing during the Cold War, we were dealing with uh, societies, communities that were naturally very susceptible to, to the Western ideas. As Mr. Nichols gave this uh, example of an officer. It was enough to show him Fifth Avenue at night, and his whole worldview started to crumble. Now, I think, with 
Islamic totalitarianism, we're dealing with an enemy that in many cases knows more about us than we know about them. Uh, they've lived in, in, in New York and, and London for generations sometimes. They've visited very often, they've been there and they still don't like it. So how, how do we deal with them? You know, what, what kind of ideological strategy we should uh, apply here? Well, the, one, one thing, I mean, you know, the, it was said of Andre Gromyko that when Gromyko was taken to the United Nations and driven in his limousine around New York, all he saw was Harlem. That's all, that, that was the only thing that registered in his mind was sort of, you know, poverty and oppression and, and racial. Uh, but I think part of that is because that was that first generation of revolutionaries. And part of the problem we're dealing with Al-Qaeda right now is that's the first generation, to me at least, I think, of these kinds of revolutionaries. But I also think it's important to say Osama's never been to the West except for one trip as a boy to Sweden. Um, and I think that th there is more insularity among those guys than, than might be realized. But I, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, so I'll leave that. Yeah, I, I just like, I actually, I think that's an area of commonality in that you, where you had an awful lot of, of um, Soviet leaders who had never been to the West, really didn't know about the West, and really, and I think we have a lot of data on this now from, you know, misperceived the West, that, that the, the people who had been here a lot, and they, they were the exception to the rule. And I think that's true with a lot of the, the certainly the leaders of Al-Qaeda and, and other people, like to, that they, and if you read their fatwas, I mean, they have a very kind of warped picture of the West that's not based on long and experience. And even, so, so I think that's actually a very common feature, and I don't think terribly unusual in a lot of strategic competitions, where one side either tends to mirror image or, or tends to mythologize their view of the other side based on the, the fact that they really don't have intimate knowledge of the, the society and culture. So I think that's a common feature as opposed to something distinctly different. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would say that um, this is also the kind of a strategy as well as, as, well as sort of educational strategy which uh, Britain was actually adapting for some time. It's a basic thing, so we must really realize that there are different ideas in the world. Um, and uh, this idea of Western values are uh, kind of universal. Oh, I can see that point very clearly. Obviously, democratic, uh, free, democratic, liberal uh, sort of system is the best uh, perhaps we could ever achieve. And I don't think this is a point of the contention. Um, I've been talking to various people. They do understand uh, the democracy or something they want to achieve eventually. But when you're coming to how you're going to adapt in your own country, in your own system, there was, of course, the uh, conflict of interest. For instance, for example, some of the Muslim ideas not necessarily compatible with a kind of equality uh, as well as those uh, free expression of the democratic country as we uphold. So how are we going to you know, adjust those um, between the democratic idea is good, but how are we going to bring these ideas into your society? There were some religions could be obstacle to adapting all these ideas, what we think is a good. I think the important thing was, A, we, so long as the ideas are concerned, if you're li uh, liberal societies, we should be able to see that uh, because of the Cold War, two extreme, uh, uh, two extreme hostile ideas, confrontation, two extreme hostile ideas. And now we are coming to the ideas, our ideas, <coughs> As, as, as opposed to the anti-Western ideas. We mustn't reduce the current problem into that. I think the important things was, um, um, you know, it's through the education or other things. This is a generally speaking, we need to soften up the ground uh, for us to express more understanding of different ideas. I'm not talking about some particular extremist uh, ideologies because my point is also some of the larger population in the international community was not very um, um, thinking of us very favorably at this time. So we really have to think about why is it, you know, why they're not particularly obviously supporting extreme uh, terrorist ideas, but they are not particularly uh, favorable to us. So this is uh, actually a huge, big problem. We are actually huge, um, uh, the sort of layers of populations 
including from Europe as well as from Asia, Africa, and particularly Arab world, thinking of us as really hegemonic powers. We wanted to control over y your societies, just as imperialism, uh, uh, imperial powers did in the past. So we really have to um, go out of the world uh, go go out of this region to think about. It. I think it's. I feel a little bit this discussion was uh, you you two were tended to reduce to the two poles of ideas. We have a beautiful idea of democracy, freedom is good, of course good, and was other idea of the extreme terrorists. But we have this middle range of layers which are not particularly, you know, respecting us or particularly the image of the Western world uh, being uh, relatively more interventionist than. Uh, we, we were given the sort of impression to the world. This is a, some of the things we need to think about. And other things is I do oppose this idea of how the power won the Cold War because of the very reason why the Soviet Union's system was defeated because they're depending so much on its hard power and had the power to control over the populations, foreign territories, either through the ideology, either through the manipulation. That's what Cold War told us about. So I think heavy dependency on the hard power. And hard power is not necessarily just use of military power. But in a sense, we, we, we were good. So therefore, you have to adapt our ideas. If not, I've got hard power to you know, penalize you. That's not the way we can deal with the international community. Thank you. Professor Wojtek Masny. Yeah. I would like to follow uh, Tom's uh, interesting idea, which I would like to quote myself sometimes. <laughs> um, Lord it, knows I've stolen enough of your stuff. So. <laughs> now, it's the credit that you give to Reagan and even to Carter, as you said, for uh, eliminating war as an option for some survival. And certainly, uh, uh, military force was notable for, that, for its absence in those dramatic dates of 1989 as the Cold War ended. Uh, but uh, you are talking here about, uh, about an external war, external use of force, whereas uh, what uh, really was critical at the end of the Cold War was the failure of the Soviet Union to use force internally, and I mean internally also within the Soviet Empire. Uh, so I wonder how you would uh, account for that, and whether you could also you know, rank it as an accomplishment of uh, uh, of any outsider, rather than just a result of a failure of nerve or uh, or, uh, or other internal factors rather than external factors. Yeah? Well, that's one question. Yeah. Another one. Yes. Uh, well, the other one uh, concerns the overall thrust of this uh, of this meeting, uh, drawing parallels between the Cold War and the war against terrorism. Uh, I think that this kind of exercise can only take place in this country. Uh, perhaps Saki will agree with me that nowhere in the world, or particularly not in Europe, would one think of parallels between the Cold War and the uh, war against terrorism, which is uh, regarded in Europe, I think, rightly, mainly a police affair rather than a war, as, uh, as it is officially regarded here. And therefore, also, when I saw those attempts to draw parallels uh, between those two conflicts as, uh, forgive me the word, very, very superficial. I mean, to say that in both cases, uh, these are protracted conflicts. Well, history is full of protracted conflicts. Uh, mm -hmm. Sparta, Athens, uh, France, uh, England during the Hundred Years' War, um, Germany, France, and there's nothing new about protracted conflicts in history. Uh, similarly, to draw a parallel, because uh, the other side hates us for what we are. Now, again, nothing new about that. Religious wars in the in the 17th century were about uh, uh, what the other guy was or what he believed uh, his religion. Uh, so, I think that trying to uh, draw those parallels would really uh, mislead us in trying to find similarities rather than seeking the clue in the differences. Uh, consequently, if we draw the lessons from the Cold War for the present, I think we should rather beware of drawing the wrong lessons rather than trying to uh, draw the right ones. Thank you. I think Jim, Jay might want to. Well, yeah, I mean, well, first, first of all, I absolutely agree. And I don't think, I don't think any of us are advocating that, that, that the notion that you would that you, there was a prescriptive 
lesson to be drawn. In other words, that is a rule book that you should follow, and if you do this, you will win. I would think that would be absolutely idiotic. I mean, I think that I think Hosaki articulated that is how you should use history to to think deeply about these. Exactly right. I absolutely agree with you. I, I think one of the arguments we try to make is this is not something new that you wouldn't necessarily go off and look at national security interests and look at international security issues radically different in dealing with this than you would in anything because there's a lot, we've been in this lots in history. This notion, I, I, I mean, I find it utterly laughable that people argue that this is some kind of new age and that transnational terrorism is some kind of new phenomenon that the world's never dealt with. I and mean, this is just silliness. So I absolutely agree with you that there have been lots of protracted conflicts in history. And I think all we're arguing is that rather than just kind of pretending that we're in some new world that doesn't exist that we should think seriously about. Now, I, will, I, I just want to take issue with the war question because the war, the issue about whether this is war or not, this is about semantics and politics and not about geostrategic thinking. I mean, what is a war anyway? I mean, we could debate that infinitely about, I mean, war is war because that's the way books are organized. I mean, it ends on the last page of one chapter is war, the, 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 the first page of the next chapter is peace. I mean, we all know that there's a continuum of these things, and even trying to articulate what's a real war as opposed to a cold war is kind of an academic exercise. Um, and, but uh, the, the debate between Europe and the United States over the war is, is about they want to do things differently, and so this is a metaphor that we use. We debate the metaphor because we're really not debating whether we're going to fight transnational terrorism or not. That's not the, for discussion. The debate is on how we're going to do it, and so we argue about whether it's a war or not, which is, who cares? I don't care what you call it, but this is a, and that's why I use the term competition. This is a competition, just like every other competition in the past has been a competition. And I just think it's silliness to get wrapped around whether we're, ha we're in a war or not. I don't care what, whether you call it. They're, guys are trying to kill us. We're trying to kill them. You know, I, you want to come up with a different name for that, I'm fine. But, but I don't think that's the real – I don't think that whether this is a, really a war or not is really anything to do with a real serious problem in terms of geostrategic thinking. I think that's just a, a term that we debate because we don't want to debate the real issues. Thank you. Tom? Um, well, first, on your very first question, Wojtek, the, the – in terms of the internal use of force. Um, I cannot take credit for my thinking on this because I think the best thing that's been written on this so far has been, uh, and I will just refer everybody to it, has been Mark Kramer's three-piece um, uh, series in the Journal of Cold War Studies. I mean, it, it's, I think it's just brilliant. Um, and I think the thing that comes out of it uh, is that Gorbachev, in attempting, I really think this is all, this is, I'm going to make this a short answer because otherwise it really devolves into kind of Soviet domestic politics, but I think that Gorbachev, in an attempt to outflank his opponents, and I think the other person who's been very good on this is Anthony D'Agostino, um, who, who really kind of has captured how foreign policy becomes this internal weapon. In order to outflank his opponents in, within the leadership, Gorbachev Ad adopts a foreign policy model that, as a matter of first principles, rules out the use of force. He has no choice. He boxes himself in by saying, I'm going to create a new kind of socialism, and I I'm predicating it on the fact that everybody wants to be part of this enterprise, and if people try and leave, well, then I can't shoot them, because then, you know, then I put a lie to the whole thing. And, and so I really think, again, you know, the, the lack, I, I will give some credit to some of the Soviet leaders including Gorbachev, for discovering their humanity at, at long last. But I also think that ideologically the construct was such that they had boxed themselves in so that they couldn't use force without completely blowing the legitimacy of, of the reform enterprise upon which they embarked. As to the war question, I think part of the problem is that as Westerners, we are too straightjacketed. I mean, and I say this as a former chairman of the strategy department, so this is going to. I think this is a good time to say I don't speak for the U.S. government. Um, I think that we spend entirely too much time reading Clausewitz and not enough time reading Sun Tzu. I mean, we have this very Clausewitzian understanding of war—that there's this bright shining line, and then one day you're at peace, and you cross this line, and you're at war, and you defeat, you capture the other guy's flag, and he surrenders, and then you're back to peace. Whereas I think Sun Tzu had this more nuanced version of war as a spectrum, as a continuum. Uh, as you know, varying levels of intensity, and I, I've always been much more attracted. I mean, it's a terrible thing for me to say, being at the Naval War College, but I don't much care for Clausewitz. I mean, I just think Sun Tzu is a much richer uh, strategic theory, especially in in the kind of world we've lived in the past fifty years. As long as you don't say anything bad about Mahan, you're okay. <laughs> well, uh, let me just say about Mahan that as a writer, he's a heck of a naval officer. Um, <laughs> but as to whether or not this is new, I, I guess I'm in heated agreement with you, and and I think part of what I, th I think part of what we're saying is um, let's stop trying to shoehorn this new world we're in as something totally alien that we've never seen before. There's a great, there was a great line 
in President Bush's September 20th uh, address to Congress, which I think, whatever you think of President Bush, was one, really one of the great presidential speeches of all time. And he said, we have seen their kind before. And I, and I really kind of twigged on that particular statement because I think he was right. This is not the kind of people we're dealing with. They're not that radically different. And I think if you're going to make effective strategy, I think if you're going to think best about how to deal with a particular opponent, you're right. It's good to know where things are different from the past and only an idiot fights the last war. On the other hand, you don't, try, you don't forget everything that you learned from the previous experience. We have dealt with a long-term ideological struggle before. We have learned things from that. And I, and I sort of feel like I'm on the edge of, you know, do, do we, can we learn anything prescriptive from it? Jay says, no, I say maybe. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Can I have a show of hands? And uh, we'll take a couple of, oh, actually, Saki, you well, your turn. Okay. I'm sorry, well, I'm sorry. Um, well, I just to, um, Yes, agree with uh, what Wojtek said about this um, comparison, uh, comparison between Cold War and new Cold War things. Um, it is quite more unique to this country rather than in Europe or even in Britain. But having said that, Tony Blair agrees on this uh, notion of war and terror, and some of, um, certainly some of the uh, British public uh, do agree on this uh, notion of war going on right now. I suppose this is a little bit exaggerated version of war because um, to some extent we must remember when the Cold War ended and realizing it's in, in fact it has turned out to be a kind of long peace, kind of stability, kind of the uh, sort of uh, we can have some kind of predictability if you like. And then we never actually thought that we are going to move into the very uncertain world and to realizing ourselves uh, or awakening you know, to the fact that the world is still remain to be a very dangerous place. The reason behind this is very easy to explain because there has been, of course, history was also progress, as I'm sure Wojtek would agree with uh, me on this. Um, if you think about it, although, yes, there are lots of con uh, conflicts, uh, conflicts it's, it's not quite uh, the, uh, easy to be resolved. But having said that, um, uh, if you think about industrialized war, uh, which you've been seeing uh, particularly in the uh, former half of the uh, 20th century, we don't have a kind of the war, conventional wars between the uh, developed societies. And that's, at, le at least we should uh, take it, this is a kind of achievement we have so far. Um, so I think there was a certain sense of we had made a certain progress when the Cold War ended. And so therefore, how are we going to, you know, sort of the, uh, develop our achievement and build on our success stories? And that's part of the reason why we reacted to 9-11 as we did. Uh, particularly when I say we, maybe probably wrong, I mean how, why the Americans, the Bush administration reacted. There was, there was a sort of a sense that we are making progress. But somehow 9-11 made us think that you, you, we may not have made you know, such progress at all. So we didn't have to strike, we mustn't be so pessimistic about it, but we mustn't be so optimistic about the situation where we are. Thank you. Um, Catherine Weathersby over here on the left, and then who else? If you could keep your hands up for a moment so I could. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to to respond to, to Tom's analysis, um, I, I, I quite agree with you when we're talking about the Soviet Union, uh, that it was fundamentally a, 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 a conflict between um, ideas about how to, uh, to govern the world, you know, how to organize society. Uh, the Soviet Union represented since November 1917 uh, the biggest challenge to liberal democracy, Western liberal democracy. And, and the struggle wasn't over until um, enough people in the leadership decided you know, uh, it was not in their interest to pursue that path any longer. So that's absolutely central. However, if you look not at the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War, but if you look at Asia, uh, the picture looks quite different. And, and there's a different story. Um, and so I think as we think about drawing uh, any kinds of you know, uh, perspectives for, for the current situation, it's very helpful to, uh, to do that. Uh, what's so striking about Asia is that nothing changed in 1989, 1991. <laughs> the Cold War ended supposedly, but nothing changed. You know, 
in the geo, uh, geopolitical uh, structure of all of East Asia. Um, well, you know, why? <laughs> and it seems I mean, to, to put it very you know, uh, quickly is that there, the ideological struggle was not only the class-based, you know, sort of classical Marxist struggle, but it was a melding of that with um, anti-colonial nationalism. And it was that melding that gave communism in Asia its strength. And it's why those governments haven't fallen. And I, I, I would suggest that if we look at the world of uh, where Islamic fundamentalism is strong, that perhaps uh, you know, there, there's some parallel there that would be worth looking at. Um, to come back to Asia, what's really happening now to bring the Cold War, as it were, to an end, is the emergence of China as a powerful state. Now, after two centuries, China is taking what it considers its rightful place in the world as a powerful actor economically and politically with uh, an appropriately powerful military. And once that happens, and only when that happens, you know, when China regains its place in the world, does the conflict between China uh, and the rest of the world, between China and the Western powers, uh, begin to dissolve. Thank you, Catherine. Why don't we take um, another question or comment and then um, turn it over. Gentleman in the white shirt there, yes. Um, earlier we alluded to... Could you identify yourself? Please? Oh, Michael Cooper, the British American Security Information Council. Um, earlier we alluded to uh, the creation of enemies in the Cold War where we applied Cold War thinking to all conflicts, whether it fitted or not, and therefore we created enemies where sometimes we necessarily didn't have to, and it really cost both sides severely. And then we were talking about... Uh, the movement away from defining, defining the war or fight, whatever you want to call it, against Islamic terrorism to Islamic totalitarianism. Um, so in terms of the, the war on terrorism, do you think there has been or there needs to be, there's no international consensus on terrorism or what it is, but do you think there needs to be a redefinition of terrorism, or there has been a redefinition of terrorism to avoid the pitfalls that we had in the Cold War? Thank you. Um, Catherine, <clears throat> I, I, I agree with your analysis right up until um, the explanation about China. And I'll say that I think the reason that uh, two things happen after 89 and 91 that makes, that sort of dampens what could have been a more vicious struggle with Asian communism. One is that there's simply no Soviet patron anymore. That there is no, there is no protection for these regimes. Now, they don't fall, but on the other hand, their, their um, um, potential for action has been circumscribed in, in important ways. Now, granted, the Soviet Union, the existence of the Soviet Union circ circumscribed their ability to act as well. I mean that, you know, North Korea was not going to get nuclear weapons as long as there was a Soviet Union. Um, but when, when you talk about China emerging as a powerful state and, t and kind of getting its place in the sun, I feel like we're talking about Germany in 1912, you know. Um, I think the, the issue here is uh, that what's really kind of dampening, the, and I, I, I sort of vacillate on how much of a danger China really is, but I think what we're really talking about is globalization. That as China becomes more and more, in a way, what we're doing with China, what Kissinger had hoped to do with the Soviet Union and failed, which is weaving it into the international community and the international economy in a way in w that gives them a stake in the status quo. That's what we were trying to do during detente. I think we failed miserably at it. But I think that's what's happening now with China, mm -hmm. that, that they realize that they just have a stake. In, in a way, they're sort of shackling their economy to ours. And, and that if we go down, they go with us. It's a, it's a suicide pact of a different kind now. So I, I, I'm, I'm sort of less convinced by the argument about China becoming a great power than I am about the fact that information is going to breach the Great Wall no matter what they do. 
that people are going to become more educated, more informed, and so on, and that there's just nothing they can do about that in a way. They can never seal China the way the Soviet Union was sealed off, and they are integrated into the international economy in a way that the Soviet Union never was. So as to the question about um, redefining terrorism, I, I, that might be kind of far afield of our remit here today, um, but I think, it, I think the one place where your question does have a parallel to the Cold War is, do you proliferate enemies by putting everything within the context of the major struggle that you're in. And I think that that is true. I think that that is partly what we're doing now, and I think it's, it's wrong-headed and stubborn. But I will add one caveat, which is it's also important to realize you know, the old maxim that even paranoids have real enemies, and that sometimes the, that places where we're, we think we're in a struggle with terrorism, we really are in a struggle with terrorism. So. We'll go to questions on the right side in a minute, but I want to give Saki and perhaps Jay the chance to respond. Saki? Um, right. I think I'll probably uh, start with this um, situation in Asia after the uh, end of the Cold War. I distinctly uh, remember that um, the, there were several, uh, we had a kind of little workshops about um, Asian security. And, and then um, some of the people who actually came from the Asian region and uh, at that time we had a kind of a strategic review, uh, British uh, Defence Department, um, uh, Ministry of Defence, MOD. And they were so surprised that we were actually reducing our defence expenditures. Our country was actually increasing our defence expenditure because we feel more fearful after the end of the Cold War. But here seems to be Europe, people were just sort of relaxing themselves because Soviet Union's you know, threat of Soviet Union completely removed. So therefore, therefore, of course, there was a regional differences in terms of the how the Cold War affected. But centrally, we tend to think about Europe is the most successful story, I would say, uh, where Cold War started to end it very clearly. But of course, pattern of the Cold War's impact on other regions, particularly the Middle East, was a very complicated one because there was never been any single factor where the Middle East conflicts uh, became, you know, evolved during the Cold War period, and still now. Um, so that was one issue. And in terms of redefinition of terrorism, uh, remember the global terrorism is a kind of the more, much more political uh, implications, and there was some some kind of much more coordinated uh, sort of the attacks, which is, you know, designed to really undermine our societies and confidence, and. Um, I think we are more sort of thinking about how to deal with it and how to deal with it in a sense that if we can you know, sort of deal with this fear and if the terrorist uh, was sort of been uh, making kind of success, successful attack much more intermittently and uh, some sort of a gap between the first and second, that actually can take it as our success, as our sort of success of dealing with those terrorism. So I think definition of terrorism can be very difficult because we would never agree on one definition. But certainly political terrorism is a certainly of which we are uh, up against at the moment. Okay, um, in the back, yeah, and we'll go down. Uh, Michael Binder, Department of Energy. I'm wondering whether it might be too late to apply the Cold War metaphor and we've already entered the hot war. Uh, maybe it was some years ago when Israel, as our surrogate, was being attacked by Islamic fundamentalism or totalitarianism, was emulating the Cold War model. When the Cold War got warm, almost invariably, it was a superpower versus a superpower surrogate in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan. It hardly ever got hot directly between the United States and the Soviet Union. Now it has got hot between the United States and Islamic totalitarianism and maybe we shouldn't look at the Cold War as a model for the war against this kind of totalitarianism. Yeah, again, I think, I think that's mis mischaracterized. You know, the, the, the key similarity, I think, is the nature of the conflict. I mean, the conflicts are protracted or they're not. I mean, there are two choices. And I think that's, if it's a protracted conflict, then I think that's one set of strategies. If it's not a protracted conflict, that's another set of strategies. This, hot, cold, shooting, not shooting. I don't think those are really the key 
the key metrics for determining where your strategies are. Crime is protracted okay. too. Okay, Jay, Jay, can I just amend that with one sentence? I think I, I'd add to that. It's <clears> not just whether they're protracted or, or although I think that's a, that's right. I would also say whether they're ideological or functional. Sometimes wars are just about something, like a waterway, a border, a, a, a throne. But when it's about one way of life versus another, then I think that that's a different kind of struggle. Okay. Over here. Uh, my name is Stephen Shore. My, uh, I, one observation I have is if you're dealing with historically the Cold War, it really helps to have a well-defined beginning. And my memory of American-Russian relations prior to the Bolshevik Revolution is that these relations were very warm, uh, very rarely warm, that the United States did not find um, czarism and autocracy any more appealing than it found communism. And 85 years before the Bolshevik Revolution, you have de Tocqueville's purple prose about um, destiny seems to have marked out these two nations for conflict. And I think it would be very helpful to um, separate what may be the, the geostrategic essence of conflicts between the Russian Empire and its successor and the American Empire from the, the historical reality is that one was nominally free enterprise and one was nominally communist uh, to have a clear beginning of the Cold, uh, Cold War in dealing with it. And the other is it was said 40 years ago and not without some grain of truth after the split between the Soviet and Chinese Communist parties, that if the Soviet Union found China difficult, imagine the problems it would face if the United States ever became communist. <laughs> and the same way with Bin Laden. In theory, if... if, if Just look if, at Massachusetts, right? I'm sorry? Just look at Massachusetts. <laughs> that if Sharia became the law of the United States, sooner or later, almost immediately there would be a new and improved Koran that the United States would try to impose on the Muslim world. And if they found us insufferable now, how much more insufferable would they find <laughs> a Muslim United States? Thank you. We'll take another one. Uh, the gentleman right next to Mr. Shore. I'm Leonard Oberlander. Think of, of this in, in terms of uh, the war of ideas and, and ideology. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, similarities between Cold War and now uh, are that there, there were cells, communist cells during the Cold War, there, there are cells now. Uh, there uh, were fifth columnists, there are such uh, now. And some of the uh, education has changed. How, uh, how has the education changed in terms of, of quality, not level of, uh, of degrees, uh, is, is something that's being currently debated in, a, in our country. Uh, the um, technologies have changed. We have communications now between people in the United States and, and outside the United States on, on the net and so forth. The, the difference, a couple of the differences are that the rhetoric has changed from workers of the world unite to now uh, referring to victims of U.S. policies, with, which, which you touched on, uh, what we're doing and, 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 and who we are. Um, there are calls in, in mass meetings, if, if you watch uh, some of, some of the, uh, the protest, um, calls for alliance of U.S. minorities with peoples of the world who are victims of U.S. policies. And they use the president's name in this. Uh, do you think, uh, in, in, in considering these, these factors, that there is a potential change in, in uh, critical mass in our demographics that are elements of our culture that make it difficult uh, in the war of ideas and ideology, or is there not much difference? And, and would people who argue that, you know, would you say that that's a that's myth that we're really dealing with the same same things? Yep. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to get my arms around your question. Um, 
I mean, I think back to the late 1960s. I mean, there were the the I mean, here we were fighting the Cold War against this socialist enemy, right? But the country was rife with violent left-wing groups. So I don't think it's all that. Um, if anything, I think we're better off now. I mean, there's no there's no Al Qaeda equivalent to the weathermen, you know, running amok in the United States, blowing up federal buildings. I and mean, we get the we get the occasional sort of right-wing crank like the late and unlamented Timothy McVeigh, but but I, we we don't have we don't have a a group within the United States that is so in sympathy with the ideals of our enemy that they have created a homegrown the FBI at one point was keeping track of dozens of homegrown terrorist organizations so if anything I would say the baby boom was a worse maybe I don't know how my colleagues feel about this but the baby boom was a worse demographic for us in the 60s because you had a lot of you know sort of the idiots like Bernadine Dorn running around and of that generation that you just don't have now because you don't have that critical mass of college you know privileged college students um, running around making nail bombs. So as as for the beginning of the Cold War, I, I, I again, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around your question, but to me, I date the beginning of the Cold War some, sometime around the, and this is a completely arbitrary date, and I changed my mind, so I, I won't be held to this, but um, somewhere around the Battle of Stalingrad. That's when I think of it as the Soviet Union goes from being kind of an ideological nuisance, you know, during the 20s and the 30s when we have the Red Terror and all, you know, and all that Red Scare stuff, um, to us turning around and saying, you know, when this thing's over, this is a this is really a threat to our entire, to the entire international status quo and our and our way of life in a way that it wasn't before World War II. So I I, I put it at Stalingrad. Maybe Jay and Saki put it somewhere else. But. Thank you. I do want to note note that we uh, want to be careful not to engage in name calling. This is a scholarly institution here. Um, All right. I, didn't, I meant to call her a terrorist, not an idiot. Um, you guys Sorry. like to well, respond? You know, I, I'm, the, the demographic question is actually very, very interesting. I, I don't have a well thought out answer because I think the one thing that, that's undeniable is that the demographics are different than they were in the 20th century and they are changing. And the question of how that's going to affect the, the differences in the ideological struggle I think is an, an, interest, an interesting one. I just I, I don't have a good answer. I mean, it's, there's a lot of silliness that's, well, I suppose, that, 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 again, in terms of, of, of Cold War signing out. Sovietology and, and, and kind of terrorist analysis. I mean, in, that we share in the early years, I think, of the Cold War, there were a lot of people that were Sovietologists that were just really witch doctors. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, but there, there was a lot of Sovietology in the early years of the Cold War that I really think was the equivalent of being a witch doctor. And it was, there was a lot of silliness. And I think that is something, again, that is shared, that in the we, we have the global war on terrorism breaks out. This is a new phenomenon that's different than the thought before. And we have to have the equivalent of the Soviet Scientologists. And we have these terrorist experts. And they tell us all kinds of things, which are just silliness, like poverty breeds terrorism, which is absolutely bogus. There's lots of countries on the planet that are very, very poor. And they don't have terrorists. And we all know that most of the major terrorist leaders are middle class people. They come from developed countries. So I, I do think that there is a, an awful lot of, of um, this kind of barn show medicine <laughs> that, that's mucking up strategic thinking now. That it's very similar to what was around in, in the early 40s and, and 50s. There was a great dissertation for somebody to write there. But I, I think the demographics is an absolutely great question. The on the origins of the Cold War, I think that's the great. We, we need historians. We should have historians. They should be fully employed. Um, <laughs> but they are the nemesis of the strategist. You cannot have intellectual purity. You cannot be a strategist and have intellectual purity. If we did that during World War II and and we had a perfect definition of fascism, the only problem is our greatest ally wouldn't have been on our side. Um, so uh, you know, I kind of put this in whether it's a war or not. I mean, if we tried, you know, for example, to date the origins of uh, the world war and terrorism, or we got bogged down in trying to come up with a perfect definition of terrorism, I mean, the real world does not, I mean, I mean we become academics, and we, we create niches of knowledge, and to do that, we codify and clarify things. And by definition, once we do that, we tend to distort reality. And that's an important academic exercise because we all live in narratives, and we think this way. And, and you know, our publishers want start dates and end dates to our books, and that's great. But we can't let academic analysis. Um, in, it should inform strategic thinking, but, but we, you cannot have intellectual purity in a in a in a discipline which is trying to shape events in a real. Thank you. Saki? Uh, 
Um, Briefly, yes. because we're okay. out of time. Right. Of course. I think this is the uh, scholarly consensus um, of the uh, origins of the Cold War is that we record it probably have started around 1946-47. And um, this is uh, because of the various strategies we put in place. And the uh, Cold War is not about just ideas of war, the ideas of hostilities and so on, because I mean, it was always, we, we, we may not like somebody because of the chemistry, but not we are not planning to uh, overnight try to kill him or her. As Cold War is much more sort of the targeting, they are the one who is going to harm us unless we prepare against it. And that sort of feeling, particularly in West, uh, Western world, is about 1946-47. Thank you. Um, I think we're just about at the uh, end of our time here, unless there is an uh, urgent any question or comment? I'd like to uh, uh, thank our panelists for inspiring uh, presentations, stimulating presentations, and thank you for sharing your insights uh, and comments. Uh, let me uh, just say that uh, Saki's book, uh, The End of the Cold War Era, is available outside if you'd like to just um, pick up a copy. And if you're interested in uh, much of the new documentation that has come out on the end of the Cold War, and for that matter, um, on the Cold War uh, as a whole, um, I recommend to you um, the website and the virtual archive of the Cold War International History Project at cwihp.org. Uh, you'll find a host of documentation there um, that can deepen some of the discussions uh, and the background that we had here today. Thank you again to my distinguished panelists, and uh, thank you for coming.